Okay, so I am live with Ricky Zhang, the Prince of Travel, and Ricky is such a cool guy. He's got this YouTube channel. I'm trying to still figure out everything that uh, you do, Ricky, because you have this YouTube channel, you've got these live events, you just had one in Toronto in October, all about using uh, credit card reward points to travel and probably other travel hacks as well at this conference. You're from BC, uh, you've graced us with your presence today here in Oakville, so thank you for coming out. I'm trying to figure out what is Prince of Travel all about, how do these credit card points work, how can we all, you know, leverage these points like you are to travel the world um your own life story there's there's just so much to go into here so ricky zhang uh give us a little bit of background on what prince of travel is and some of your story yeah thanks so much for having me anthony it's great to be here it's a real pleasure um so prince of travel is a company that i founded about six years ago now and back then the, the motivation was very much to you know, share with Canadians um, how to travel the world using your points, because that was something I was really deep into figuring out at the time, how to maximize the rewards points and credit cards that are available out there to travel for a fraction of the price. And were, were you traveling a lot? When I you was, younger? I was traveling. Yeah, I was, you know, fortunate to travel from a young age. But what, when it came to like just with your family, just like my a, family, you know, family trips here and there. And you always were in B.C.? I was born in BC and then I, we moved, um, when I was like one year old, we moved out to Asia and then we traveled around Asia a fair bit and then, you know, trips to Europe and North America every, every now and then. Oh, wow. But, um, and then when did you come back to Canada? That would have been 18 years old. Oh, so 18. For university. Oh, okay. Were yeah. you by yourself then or were you? Yeah. By myself at, at U of T. Oh, wow. So and just, your parents were still in Asia? My parents stayed in, stayed in Beijing. In yeah. Beijing. Okay. So you were an international student. I was... Yeah, I guess you could call that. But since I was born in Canada, I was like also treated as a still a citizen. As a, as a yeah. So why'd you pick Canada? Domestic student. Um, it was kind of like since I'm Canadian, right? And we, I went to international school in Asia. It's like it was treated as one of the default options. It was basically either Canada or the U.S. Okay, so uh, this is actually really interesting to us as like real estate investors because yeah. we're seeing so much foreign student demand and international students pour into Ontario. For sure. To all these schools and student rental demand right now is exploding, even though the rest of the real estate market is kind of like cooled down a bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you're saying Canada is a default option with the U.S.? For me, uh, since, since, since I am a citizen. Canadian, yeah, that, that was default option for me. But I'd say that for most international students, it's, it's seen as one of the you know, the natural choices, usually Canada, US, UK, Australia, you, you pick one of the four and you, you know. Is that just because of the quality of our schools, the, the quality of the country? Yeah, it's generally viewed as one of the, one of these Western countries tends to have, uh, you know, the better, the better education okay. options. And then it just comes down to things like cost and which schools you get into and stuff. Okay. And then just uh, reputation wise, like how are people in China thinking of maybe Canada versus US, Australia? Like, what is that? Like your honest thoughts? Yeah. Like, yeah. This is really interesting, actually, because if you look at major globally published, you know, rankings of universities, U of T and McGill are consistently up there with, you know, the Ivy Leagues of the world. Oh, wow. So I'd say that among international students, there's a, I mean, obviously the Ivy Leagues are, you know, are up there in terms of desirability. But after that, I'd say U of T and McGill are shortly following suit um, alongside some U UK names as well. Um, and and that's that was surprising to me when I came here because, you know, people are, there's there's also a bunch of other schools that I've had never heard about until I actually came and lived in Toronto. And it's like, okay, these are also great schools as well, you know, like Queens, Western, the, and those ones. But yeah. internationally, it's just U of T McGill are just up there in the rankings, it seems. Oh, wow. Okay, so then, sorry, you went to school here in Ontario? Yeah, University of Toronto, four years. I did my third year study abroad in London, UK, um, and then came back, finished it up. And then, uh, yeah, it's been, after that, I worked at, worked at the bank, worked on Bay Street for two years, and then started Prince of Travel after that. Wow. So did you get this confidence to travel, to study abroad, like through your university and stuff, just from how much you traveled as a kid? I'd say that, yeah, there was... There was a period, um, first year, second year, I was like trying to adjust to life in Toronto. Um, maybe not like the most successfully, but I was looking for also a bit of a new experience. And because I had traveled a lot as a kid and also keeping in mind, you know, growing up in Asia, but also being exposed to 
just like the Western world, just going to an international school and all that. Um, there's definitely a part of me that's very much interested in living in as many places as possible and understanding the world from many different perspectives. So back then in the second year of university, I was like, yeah, let's, you know, let's give this study abroad thing a go. I'd always enjoyed my trips to the, to the UK, to London in the past. So um, yeah, it was University College London that I picked and uh, spent a year out there before, before coming back. Cool, man. And um, what were you doing on Bay Street? I was in back office. Uh, I think I, I think it's back office the term, but I was in um, the the finance department. So it's actually kind of interesting story how I how I got the role. Um, I studied math and economics in university, and so Bay Street finance roles are kind of one of the default options in terms of uh, your progressing your career, right? Yeah. And then typically you go do a summer internship before your fourth year. That's kind of the you know, the track towards a career straight out of university um, in the field. Uh, for me, I was studying abroad in the UK and then gallivanting around Europe during the summer, right? So I kind of let my career aspirations <clears throat> fall by the wayside a little bit. Yeah. Came back in fourth year, I was like, all right, I guess we need to, you know, work on, life. <laughs> work on what, some money. what's happening afterwards, right? Um, so then I was doing some networking, um, trying to understand, you know, now that I've missed out on this summer internship opportunity, like this window of opportunity, right? What's what's my next move? Um, and I was looking, trying to, trying to get into some of the, you know, conversations around full-time roles after graduation. But uh, the best I could do was to enter my name into the pool of candidates for summer interns. Um, this was through a contact of mine at, uh, at, at one of the big five banks. So I was in the pool for summer interns, um, but the eligi eligibility for summer interns is very much, you have to be going back to school the following year. And so when I was in the interview process, they just kind of asked like, you know, can you confirm that you're going back to school the following year? I'm like, I mean... I could. That was as deep as the check went? <laughs> yeah, I was hey, like, going well, back. Oh, yeah. nothing's stopping me from taking a fifth year of university if I wanted to, um, but I want to have some experience in uh, in, in working, so I'm just going to take this summer internship it, if offered to yeah, me. Yeah, right? it's so important getting that work experience, because yeah. I found as a student and so many of my friends, like I went to business school, and I was just like working in a warehouse full-time to pay my way through school. For sure. And I just needed the money, and it was good gig, so I never pursued anything else, but as soon as I graduated, you know, and you go to look for a job, everyone wants that hard work experience, even yeah. though it's, even if it's just an internship that was free Yeah. and you know, and you're like, look, I'm trying to get the experience so I can get into this job market. Right. Yeah. 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 So I was like, I need that, you know, I need some experience no matter what, like, you know, if, if, if it comes down to it and it's like, in order to be eligible for the summer internship, you have to go back to school. I'm like, okay, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, went for the interviews, I got the internship, and then I sat down with the recruiter that summer. I was like, so how strict was that requirement? And she was like, oh, we don't care. <laughs> you know, and that was my first sure. uh, instance of like understanding that, you know, there's terms and conditions and then there's like what actually happens. And then sometimes that's flexible, right? So that, 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 that's something that served me well over the years, just to understand that pra pragmatism um, in certain things. Um, and essentially it's, it's, you know, creating my own luck in that sense, but also hard work, right? Because it was during that summer internship that I performed well and um, performed better than a colleague on my team who was on a contract role that the team eventually asked me to stay and uh, and replace him in that role for, uh, for full time after I graduated that summer. So that's how I kind of got into this um, fairly cushy entry level job, I would say, straight out of, out of university, at least considering that I had missed this, you know, window of opportunity to like enter um, like front office roles in uh, in the bank. Okay. Um, through the summer internship, that's like very often how it goes. Um, yeah, and then continue doing that for two years. But I would say, you know, six months into the job, I was like, okay, this is nice. This pays the bills, modest bills that I had at the time, but um, maybe not exactly, you know, your life, your terms kind of work. Yeah. Yeah. Was was it just a bit soul sucking? You just didn't couldn't see yourself doing it for a long time. Yeah, it was the kind of work that was, got pretty, um, yeah, it got pretty repetitive, pretty you know, dry. day by day, pretty yeah. dry. And then it was the kind of, you know, no, disrep no disrespect to my, my former colleagues, but I just, I, I didn't see myself kind of career, uh, continuing in that career path. Yeah, term. sure, sure. With the culture and stuff, sometimes it's just not a fit. Yeah. Um, so then how do you get into the credit card points and then eventually starting Prince of Travel? Yeah, so it was very much around that time. Basically, um, the story kind of follows, you know, my 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 
I always, I always think of travel as a lifelong pursuit, right? And mm-hmm. so I was fortunate to start from an early age. But after becoming independent, it was up to me to figure out how to continue without like, you know, family trips and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And then it was during university, actually, it was that study abroad in the third year that um, just before that, I was uh, I had just met uh, my, my girlfriend at the time, my fiance now. And um, I was trying to figure out, okay, I'm going to London for a year. How, how do we, you know, see each other during this time? Like, how do I come back and take some trips and fund that, right? Um, very, like, I was only working very modest, like, uh, student side jobs at the time. So even a plane ticket, right, that's, like, a significant expense. So I was like, okay, what do we do about this? Yeah. So that's where, right? So many I, stories start with, like, uh, you know, a woman providing motivation. <laughs> so I start thinking creatively, figure stuff there's out. Always, there's always, yeah you know, different types of motivation out there, right? <laughs> yeah. um, obviously, for me, I, I definitely wanted to travel as well. Um, going to Europe, part of it was, you know, the whole backpacker experience, the whole Euro trip. Um, but there's low-cost flights and all that, right? Yeah. But then when it comes to flying across the Atlantic, like, okay, we need, we need to th- think here and need to do some research. So, yeah, it really just led me down a rabbit hole of figuring out how does... Um, yeah, how, how, do, how do points work? Like, how do credit cards work? Because he, I, I had dabbled a little bit and seen that, um, you know, I, I, had, I had stumbled online that there was some, some resources for, like, how to, you know, leverage your points to fly for free. That These are, like, of, different blogs kind of and type of stuff. Exactly, different websites, different blogs, a few online forums, that kind of thing. So it was really quite a deep rabbit hole that I went down. And uh, eventually I figured out, okay, there's a few Canadian-issued credit cards that are offering a first year free right now and a welcome bonus of enough points that will fund like a round trip flight between London and Toronto. Just for signing up. Just for signing up. And it was completely free. First year free. Um, Obviously the question is what happens after the first year? Yeah, and can you you cancel? Can you cancel? Yeah. And then the answer is is yes, right? So then I had to research that and understand the game a little bit, but then it was very much coming down to like, okay, it's time to give this a try. And so it was actually right before I left for London that I actually applied for that first credit card with the intention of getting the points and using those points to fund a flight. Yeah. And I was living in very temporary, uh, like a temporary housing unit then, because I was just in Toronto for two months um, between a summer trip to, this was 2014. So I was going to Brazil for the World Cup. That was like a, a pure fun trip that I really wanted to go on. Mm-hmm. And then... Um, uh, and then I was going to, that was in June. And then in London, and going to London was in August. So I was living in Toronto for two months, hanging out with my girlfriend. And I was living in this, you know, $600 a month, like one of six units in Chinatown. Mm. You know, one of those places. Um, that was the only address good, I had. Good food though, eh? Probably some good, good food nearby. Yeah, some uh, good not food great, options. like uh, high living conditions. Living conditions, let's <laughs> yeah. say. Um, I, I never ventured into that communal kitchen yeah, uh, once. Sure. Um, yeah, you don't was, want to. You just want to enjoy the food, right? Yeah, I just want to like head out, yeah. head out there. Um, that was the only address I had, mm-hmm. so I was like, had like I was vacating the premises after a while, mm-hmm. um, but I had to get the credit card delivered there, and so I actually got my girlfriend to go to the credit. Uh, sorry, got my girlfriend to go to the uh, the temporary living quarters to look for it in the mail because I had already left. And uh, she found it in the garbage can because they had thrown it out. Oh, wow. Like they threw out the credit card. But then she, she found it, you know, got the credit card, got the, got the number. We got it activated. And it, yeah. was like spend, it was like spend $1,000 to earn 30,000 Aeroplan miles, as oh, they wow. called them, Aeroplan miles at the time. And what's like um, a trip from like London to, sorry, was it Toronto? You're yeah, London, to? Toronto. I think, I think it would have been 30,000 miles for a one-way flight. Okay. Just in economy class, right? Yeah. For, back then it was like, okay, that's what we need. So let's hit the spend, right? Usually yeah. for credit cards, you've got your welcome bonus, you've got your minimum spending requirement. So it's like how much money you have to spend in the first X months, usually three or six months, okay. in order to earn the miles. Um, and f- and know, that's like, part of that welcome bonus? Like to get exactly, this, you to have get to the spend this bonus. much money? And usually it's like the higher the bonus, the more you have to spend. Okay, so you're just looking, I guess you must have your expenses dialed in because you know exactly how much you're gonna spend. Like, you know that you can hit those spending requirements? That's that's the way to play the game. You have to have a plan for meeting that spend in order to, uh, before you apply. Okay. So th- that was an intro card, like a pretty uh, mid-tier card, right? It was a first year free. Um, so the spending requirement wasn't that high. It was like $1,000 in three months or something. So I was like, okay, we're going to hit this spend. So I spent it and then got the miles. And then I was like, okay, here's the miles. Now I'm going to book this flight on this date. Um, 
and then I, I went through the whole process, right? And, and so how does that work, redeeming the miles? Because I've only ever had cashback credit cards. Okay, that's where <clears throat> you're missing out, my friend. Yes, oh, that's <laughs> that's another reason why I wanted to talk to you, That's man. That's where you're missing out. Um, yes. How does redeeming the miles work? That's a great question. Um, basically, uh, Essentially, airlines, uh, the whole the whole economics of airline seats, think about it like this, right? Um, once an airline seat is unfilled and the plane departs, it's just completely lost revenue. Yes. Right? Right? Because you can't, the airline can't sell that seat again for cash. But up, up until the very last minute, the airline can sell that seat, and often for a huge premium, because last minute travelers, whether it's typically business travelers, right, yeah. they will pay... Uh, the company will pay a large premium for that seat, especially in business class too, business class uh, for, you know, uh, or premium cabins, let's say. Mm. Um, so the airline faces a problem where they, you know, they have this distressed inventory, right? It's, it's about to be worth zero, but until the second that the plane door closes, it's actually potentially worth a huge premium. So they can't just mm. put, they, they can't just put it on sale towards the last minute or else everybody's just gonna wait till the last minute to buy the plane ticket. Yeah, like right. any other inventory, they, exactly. you just put it on sale if you can't get rid of it. But but the airline's not in a position to do that because they know that actually people will pay a premium for that last minute travel. Yeah. So what's the solution for them? This is, uh, this is kind of the genius of loyalty programs that one of the airlines came up with in the 1980s and has since proliferated in the industry, right? The way that they deal with that is very much, they have the loyalty program, they have the points, and they make these seats available for people to use points for. So they reward their most loyal customers with their with the ability to redeem points uh, at a fraction of the price for flights. Is is this just for last minute or in general? In general, so okay. so the the pattern tends to be um, in order to keep the the reward system going. Right, airlines have to provide like a pretty reliable number of seats on each flight, and they tend to release about two business class seats, more economy class seats uh, in advance. But then towards the last minute, as this distressed inventory problem becomes more real, they tend to release even more seats. Mm. So you see, you tend to see more and more uh, seats becoming available at the last minute. But in advance, there's also seats available as well. You just sometimes need to be flexible and you know be able to find the right seat uh, that fits for your needs. But that's essentially how you know, this whole ecosystem of using points for flights exists. It's not really using points to pay for the same flights that you get um, when you pay cash. It's a very much a subset of the inventory. <clears throat> okay. Um, but, uh, but that's kind of the, the way that the whole ecosystem is set up. It's very much a way for airlines to re reward their most uh, loyal uh, participants in the program. In the past, that has always meant frequent flyers. But over time, that has evolved to be like just engaging with the program, right? Using the co-branded credit card, signing up for the card, participating in the program's partners and what whatnot. So these days, for example, Aeroplan's the biggest one in Canada. Yeah, I was gonna have, ask, right, at the, I think it's LCBO, they ask you for Aeroplan exactly. now. Exactly, they've struck up these partnerships, LCBO, Uber, Starbucks. So if you, have, uh, if you have an Aeroplan account, if you're collecting points, eventually you have the opportunity to go ahead and redeem them for, for flights. And the reason I say cashback users are missing out is because you have cashback card. It's a fixed, reliable 2% tops. Yeah. In Canada, it's probably less. Yeah. 1.5. Yeah, I think mine, mine's a free one I signed up for a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, which I know it's probably time to level up my credit card game here because I think I was like 20 when I got it. And at the time, it was 1.25% cashback. Uh, Amex, simply yeah. cashback or something. Yeah. Yeah. And I've just kept using, I think it's even lower now. It's like 1% or something. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's. I think the Amex Simply Cash is decent as far as cashback cards go. Exactly. But the very, yeah, the, the idea is, right, if you take your points and if you compare that against how much it would cost you to book flights, mm. whether in economy or in a more extreme case, business class, right, business class is like thousands of dollars, but the points cost is fairly reasonable once you break it down and do the math. So the value you're getting out of your points and thereby the return you're getting from your spend is significantly more than when you do cashback. Now, the trade-off is cashback is flexible, right? Yeah, cashback can be used for, for anything and you can use it anytime you want. Yes. And the, and the airline side, remember we talk about this, this whole ecosystem that the airlines have set up, right? You can only use your points for certain flights that the airlines make seats available for redemption. Not for every flight out there. Okay, so every flight that's going, there's a certain percentage that the airline has allocated for exactly. those uh, reward points. They've got these models, right? They, yeah. They're thinking like, how many seats can we sell? And how many seats are we unlikely to sell? 
they have the models, right? They know. Yeah. Um, they can project. And f- from these seats, they're unlikely to sell. They'll drip feed a few for people to use on points so that they reward people, right? Keep them more engaged with the airline and fill these seats without having them go out empty. Do the credit card companies, do you think some of them secretly hate you? <laughs> or the airlines? Because you're like a, revealing their secrets? I think there's a love-hate. I think there's a love-hate relationship. But um, Well, yeah, because you're helping so many people probably get on these loyalty programs. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's very much, uh, you know, they probably... They're like, don't tell us, don't tell too many secrets, Ricky, you know? (laughs) I think that, yeah, exactly. They probably appreciate us, you know, letting more people know about the opportunity, but not too many people letting letting them know about the the, the golden opportunities. Okay. All right. Good point. But you're on their radar. You're on their radar. Yeah. Yeah. It tends to, it it tends to be that way. Yeah. They're like, we got to watch this guy. He's uh, with great power. comes great responsibility. There's, there's, there's a few fun things we could get into there, but yeah, there's, um, uh, there's, there's, there's like for us, the focus is always on like, how do we manage that, right? And how do we manage that relationship to make sure that, you know, we're not like, uh, you know, pissing off our, our industry partners while also being able to therefore, you know, serve our audience best with okay. the, uh, the access that we have. So how does this evolve? So you get this trip now to yeah. um, Toronto and then what? You're already going down this rabbit hole. Mm-hmm. How do, how, where do we go from here? Well, so that was 2014, right? Okay. So, and, and this, I, I iterated that a few times, figured out uh, a few round trip flights. I think it was one round trip for me back to uh, Toronto and then another trip I just paid for. And then I brought my uh, girlfriend to London on a one way. And actually I, I took care of her return as well. So, okay, two round trip flights in economy. I was like, okay, this is, this. I understand how this works, right? So let's see how far we can push it. Um, because I understood that this, um, the, the, the sequence is just, is, you know, applying for a credit card, earning the points. Um, if you use your credit card responsibly, this is very important, I think, but I do think the audience here, uh, fully appreciates it. Um, which is like, you have to be very diligent, right? About how you use your credit card. You have to pay off every balance in full and on time. You have to essentially treat it like a debit card because if you use your credit card and you get sucked into overspending or you're hit with interest charges or you carry a balance, right? That quickly, um, eats away at any value you get from rewards points mm-hmm. and it makes it like you're better off not doing it. But if you have the financial discipline, right, to always be um, be current on your account, then you're reaping the rewards, you know, uh, as a bonus on top. That's how to play the game and win, essentially. Mm-hmm. And so I understood, you know, that part, obviously. So always using my credit cards um, responsibly, paying sure. them off on time and in full and maintaining a reasonable utilization because those are the f- main factors that contribute to your credit score. I was going to say, and mm-hmm. doing this, you're also building your credit score <laughs> massively, which is going to help you keep getting these credit cards, exactly. which I know you keep leveraging. And that's something that I think many people don't understand, right? They think if you get a bunch of credit cards, your credit score is going to tank, like no matter what you do. But if you get a bunch of credit cards and demonstrate that you can use, you know, 10, 12, 15 credit lines responsibly and you're managing that, then it makes it easier to get more in the future. Mm. So once I understood that, and also that, you know, yeah, yeah, I understood the process and I understood that you can in fact do this on multiple cards. Then the question was, what are the best offers available out there, right? And how do we, you know, how do we fund trips that are not just an economy, but and just to like travel back and forth to visit each other. But once I move back to Canada, um, how do we take some fun trips and how do we, you know, leverage the, maximize the value of these points? Because... I knew that um, I was only booking economy class flights because kind of that's what the points that I had. But if I could get some more points and maximize their value, then I could be experiencing business class or first class, right? And those are some like fun obsessions that I've had since I was a kid. Like I was always the, the kid who was like, mom, dad, why can't we sit in these seats? <laughs> yeah. You know, instead of like going to economy class. Why are they drawing a curtain up there? Yeah, yeah like what's what's happening? Yeah, why are those people better than us? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's interesting, right? It's it, like the airplane cabin is one of the few places and then like the, the boarding process and the cabin is one of those few places where like the stark reality of just like s- hierarchies and whatnot yes. is just presented so, you know, in such such uh, such clear focus for all to see. Yeah. Um, just that moment when, you know, your business class passenger is settled in comfortably in the seat and the economy class passengers are walking by, right? It's just like, oh, oh yeah, eye contact. Oh yeah, you're like the peasant walking by. You're like, oh, I mean, look at these guys living the life up of, here. Yeah, living life. So I was always curious about that. Right? I was like, how do we make it happen? So yes. so that was also a component that drove me, like just looking to understand, yeah, like what's what's happening. Um, and, I, and I knew I had to like 
seek out the best way to you know make that experience happen and yeah yeah yeah, that was that was really the next step for me that was fascinating and for me it was also um there's also this other website right that inspired our work uh called one mile at a time and i was reading about it and i was like how is this guy who's like 26 27 not that much older than me right how is he flying first class like all the time yeah so so that was you know, that kind of pisses you off. He a bit. was he was posting his adventures. I was like, I I want to experience that too. Oh, totally. Um, you know, it was very much a moment of inspiration. There, I, I look at you and I'm like, oh, this guy's like my age. Like, what, what's he doing? <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of pissed off. Why yeah, is he well, traveling so I'm, much? I'm looking to pay it forward <laughs> here, right? <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. So, um, so yeah, I was like, okay, like let's let's scale this up a bit, right? So, actually, it was interesting. Even in like the summer when I was uh, studying abroad and then I was preparing to come back to Canada, I was already making a plan. Like the moment I land in Canada, here's the cars I'm applying for Mm -hmm. and here's the order I'm doing it in here's the relationships with the banks that I'm looking to build Uh, just made a plan like listed out and here's how these points that I'm earning from these cards are gonna fund like this trip that I want to take next year so cool and and I think that's a you know if, if we just zoom out a bit and talk about how the average listener can apply some of the things we're gonna talk about today, yeah. right? that's that's like a key component making a plan having a goal that you're aiming for in terms of travel what type of trip you want to take, where you want to go, how many people, which class of service, working backwards from there, um, how many points is that going to cost, like kind of figuring out that, sort of, that side of it, and then how do I apply for the right credit cards um, and time my spending patterns, right, because we talked about the spend, to earn those points to book those flights. It's that nuance. Do you need to know all those single little details? The more, the more you, this is one of those things, right? Where the more you put in, the more you get out of it. Okay. Right? The, the more you are meticulous, the more you can actually shape and mold your, your dream trip. Um, mm. I, I tend to find that a good entry point for a lot of people into, into this stuff is, um, is honeymoons, right? Yeah. Cause if you're, first of all, if you're, if you're planning a wedding, you've got lots of spend coming up, you want to put them on the right credit cards, unlock the right bonuses. And then it's like, okay, honeymoons, usually the, you know, like t- take, take travel obsessives like myself out of the equation. For most people, the honeymoon is your once in a lifetime trip. You want to do it the best, right? You want the best experience. Um, maybe splurge for yeah. business class or first class, but definitely stay at a nice place, that kind of thing. And uh, for a lot of people, that's that's a great starting point. Right? Like, Dude, a guy like you would be so cool to be integrated with like a wedding planning company. Thanks that's, for the idea. Oh, is that a good idea? Because <laughs> it idea. just seems obvious. Idea. Like, yeah, there's a huge spend coming up, yeah. a massive spend, and there's this honeymoon trip that they're planning anyways. Yeah. If you could somehow tie in, you know, to the financially minded person. Uh, that's a... Uh that's something I'm, I'm surprised we haven't actually already taken taken steps towards making happen. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good good shout. Oh, cool, cool. This is like the mastermind concept, course, right? You course. talk to someone, all of a sudden ideas are floating yeah, around. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. Okay, so um, the wedding. Um, what were we talking about? Basically, that was yeah. The, that was the next the next step. Yes. Um, okay. So then, do you start like your YouTube channel at this point? 2015, 2016, it was coming to 2016 that I was like, okay, there's something here that's like, that's, that has value, right? Clearly like this knowledge can make a real impact in people's lives. Like, uh, you know, uh, uh, not just one, not just one once in a lifetime, like top quality trip, but the knowledge and understanding to make multiple of these trips happen for yourself and transform the way you travel and transform this, you know, key component of your lifestyle like that, that's very valuable. Um, and I was like, nobody's talking about this. Like there's no resources out there besides these very obscure forums, right? That, and were they, like were they, um, to dig through. yeah. Were they Canadian at all? Or, you know, there's actually lots of us resources. Yeah. I was about and to I say had to, uh, what I had to do is read a lot of us stuff and kind of apply the principles. Uh, to exactly. Take yes. the principles, but then the exact details are always different, right? Cause the credit cards are different. The loyalty programs are different. Um, that was a lot of mental work that went into that. And I was like, you know, there's, this is something that I would really enjoy doing. Like I would really enjoy kind of sharing what I know and, uh, and building a community around this. Um, this was early 2016. I had the idea and I was, I was traveling a little bit. Um, and remember one a mile at a time, which is the website that I was reading at the time. He, he would always post these very in-depth, very comprehensive reviews of all the airlines and hotels he was staying at. I was like, I should do some reviews like, you know, since I'm already, I'm already staying at this hotel, let's just take some photos, see what's going to happen. Right. So I had the idea, but, um, I didn't take action for a whole year and a little bit. And the reason I didn't take action is because 
I couldn't think of a domain name for the website. Oh no. <laughs> I just, I couldn't think of anything. Yeah. Right. It was like, I, I was kept trying to think like, this has to be a, a, a good name for the website, for the whole thing. Just nothing, nothing would come to me. And so the whole idea was on the back burner for about a year or so before um, I was sitting in the second cup coffee shop um, in, um, at a Bloor Young in Toronto. So just, uh, yeah, that intersection, I was like, oh, okay, Prince of Travel. So I was, I was trying to think of like random words of travel because that just like kind of where my mind went. Mm -hmm. And I was checking if the domain was available. And um, yeah, end of the day when princeoftravel.com was available, I was like, all right, this uh, this is it. May not make sense to anyone immediately, but I feel I feel something here. Yeah, um, I feel you. like it could work. So let's give it a go. Okay, and that was it. So that was like around February 2017, and that was the origin story of um, of of the company. We just it started with one blog post. Wow, just just one blog post. So you start a blog, mm -hmm. sharing the stuff you're learning specifically for Canadians. Yeah. And then you start a YouTube channel. Are you doing like a blog post and then making a video about that blog post and kind of leveraging content and building up from there? The video side didn't even start until 2018, like was, was my first video. And that was like, that was me trying to film on a plane uh, because I was taking one of my first first class flights, right? For, the, for those who are not, you know, living and breathing aviation and travel, right? Business class is kind of your your standard lie flat pod seat like it's what's on air canada for example and first class international first class is um is not just a pod seat right it's a huge suite and instead of like a three course meal you get like a seven course meal and instead of you know johnny walker black label you get johnny walker blue label that kind of thing right oh it's a very God. premium very very personalized service I feel like a king up there exactly it's very much um it's very much the pinnacle of commercial aviation and so i was taking one of my first like super uh super extravagant first class flights um and i was like okay i've seen these flight videos on youtube so i'm gonna make um a flight video and i didn't know anything about production or gear or video creation right so it turned out <laughs> it turned out pretty shit, honestly. Sure, yeah. You know, sure. I go, I look back. I don't even want to watch the video these days. Like it's yeah, it which is such great. a common story here with YouTubers. Of like, course, oh, first video was on my iPhone four, and it's like. But I also knew that going in. Like I had yeah. to make that first video to get good at to understand what goes into YouTube and video production. Yes, but it was very much yeah, starting with that with that video, um, and then in t 2019 we started doing some like explainer videos, just talking about the subject matter as well, introducing people to points, right? Telling your, people- your blog's picking up steam. Exactly. Visitors. The, the blog is growing then. It's like- Is it just organically? Are you doing SEO? It's It was very organic at the start. It was very word of mouth. Yeah. It was very in the community, right? In the existing community of, because in Canada, like even though there's not many, there weren't many good resources, there was like a, a small pocket of, you know, enthusiasts, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Definitely so, has grown since then, uh, you know, and I'd say we've played our part in that, but uh, at the start, yeah, it was very much existing people who liked and shared, you know, and cared about the content and benefited from it, um, bringing it to that level of growth. But it was around 2019 that I decided, okay, the blog's going well, right? And we're gonna start adding some SEO elements so that we can rank on Google and start bringing in new, uh, new eyeballs and, and new visitors. But obviously video is also picking up huge traction, right? It's kind of like the future of content. So now's the time to give this YouTube thing a try and start being on camera and just being more comfortable there. Yeah. And you know, as you know, that's, that's a whole skill set that gets built over time. And so 2019, we posted some videos, 2020, um, we continued uh, doubling down on that pandemic hit. Uh, kind of an interesting time for us, but you know, after the first two three months of uh, of you know, kind of a significant dip in traffic and revenues and whatnot, uh, it was pretty clear that okay, the the worst is over. Everybody everybody is now just like looking forward to travel coming back. And so actually it's interesting. You're like, this is about to blow. <laughs> this is that was the time when actually until then it was just me doing the whole thing. Yeah. It was pretty much just me. Um, but that was the time when it's like, okay, now's, now's the time to build, right? Now's the time to build for the future. And now we have this opportunity to really, um, to really, uh, yeah, take a step back, understand the task at hand, and then start expanding the, the scope of what we do beyond just me as a solopreneur, but mm -hmm. bringing in team members, uh, you know, covering covering just more topics, putting out more content, getting people hyped for the return of travel. And once travel fully comes back, uh, we're well positioned to really to really grow from there. 
So yeah, it was really very much, I would say, even though we're founded in 2017, even though it all started from that one one blog article back then, um, 2017 to late 2020 was almost just like me figuring it out. You know, it was not like Prince of Travel is a company kind of, you know, trying to make an impact. It was like me figuring it out. And then early 2021, when we started bringing on our first team members, that's when things started to pick up uh, even more momentum. So can I ask how you initially made revenue and were able to quit your job to do this full time? Like, what was that transition like? Yeah, definitely. So the the standard business model in our industry, right? If we talk about points, if you talk about rewards, kind of the prevailing business model is basically credit card affiliates, okay. right? Because we, we talk about all the different credit cards out there. We recommend certain ones over others, but we'll also kind of talk about, you know, there's at the end of the day, there's there's a good fit for each credit card for the right type of person. So we you know, we talk about the benefits and uh, strengths and weaknesses of each card. And when people choose to sign up for the cards, right? There's affiliate links and that tends to have uh, that tends to be a common monetization model in the space just because and blogs in general, right? Blogs in general, yeah. um, but especially for traveling on points, right? This whole idea because you need kind of credit cards are a key tool to that. Mm-hmm. Um, And banks have budgets for this kind of stuff, right? So that tends to be um, a common monetization model. So that got us off the ground a little bit Um, at the start. I quit my job on Bay Street in May 2018. So about a year and a few months after starting. Oh, wow. And I would say that the the income wasn't quite at a full-time, like, you know, uh, full-time role on Bay Street level just yet. But at least I saw a trajectory. Yes. Right? I saw a... The I saw that this was potentially viable. So then it was like, okay, if I can leave my job and travel more and create more content as a result, um, yeah. but I, and also focus more on Prince of Travel, like this is definitely something that uh, I want to I wanna at least give it an honest yeah, go. Yeah, you saw the opportunity right. cost of staying at the job. And, yeah, yeah, basically. Like it so, would, would have been a huge regret if I, if I hadn't made that move. Amazing. Um, but it, it, it did take a fair bit of, you know, um, moonlighting to get there. Yeah. I'm sure, you know, right. Like it, the kind of, I was, I was, um, whipping up blog posts during my lunch breaks at work with my remote keyboard and my iPhone, for example, like that's sometimes what it takes if you want to go from side hustle to full time. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm, and your coworkers are like, Ricky, what do my you coworkers do? were like, yeah, what, what, what is happening? I was just like, oh uh, yeah, just typing up a blog post, right? Like no big deal. Ricky, we're going to get lunch. Like, come on, let's go. What the hell are you doing? It does take, it does take a fair bit of sacrifice. Um, but, um, those are, those are moments that I'm very grateful for because that's kind of what led down the whole journey. Yeah. That determination and the ability to put the blinders on Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, just know, Hey, I've got something here. Yeah. Yeah. When, when nobody really believed, right. Even, you know, even, even my, uh, my girlfriend at the, t- at the time, she was like, you should probably stay at the job for a bit longer. And yeah. And it's totally fair. Like, um, you know, they just don't have the same maybe insight. Like you were part of these communities, like, you know, like, Hey, there's this Canadian community I can build. There's these, this blog I can build. There's these affiliates. This is how I can make money. Like you just, it's hard to communicate that vision to other people who might not be as embroiled in that mm-hmm. world. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. So then you build this, so then it keeps scaling. And so what, it, what, like, how do you exactly help people now? Like you obviously know what you're talking about. So is it like, um, like how, how do you help people? How, how can people learn more about this type of stuff? Yeah, so now we've, so now we've arrived at the stage where we have content on a variety of platforms, right? We have our, our website, which I would say has kind of the most in-depth articles and a, a very wide range of articles geared towards basically every travel outcome that you can think of. Um, we have our newbies guide, so it's a place to start understanding how the, how the game hole works, which is basically you know, what I've just said. Yeah, which is uh, where I want to go like, yeah, immediately. To that's find where, out that's where to go stuff, to right? like get, get your first okay. steps. Um, Princeoftravel.com. Princeoftravel.com. Okay. Um, on YouTube, right, we've got constant videos coming out telling people about the latest credit card deals, the latest strategies, um, understanding basically every step along the process because there is, you know, a fair a fair bit of, uh, it's a fairly big body of knowledge, right? If you wanted to like kind of DIY it and really get into everything and understand everything, right, there's a lot to absorb. So everything from the blog to YouTube to our social media content as well, which is basically the same things, but bite-sized. Yes. Um, you know, it's, it's readily available out there. And then also we, we talk, you know, we, we share a lot about the outcomes and the experiences as well, just to kind of help you understand exactly what's possible. Right. So 
everything from the best, the most ostentatious first class cabins in the world that you can aim for as one of your long term goals in this game to even just, you know, a business class flight that, you know, for, for, for business owners, let's say helps them arrive well rested at their destination mm. or, you know, even on a leisure trip helps you, you know, maximize that day after you arrive where otherwise you'd just be like resting. Right. Mm. And instead you get to maximize, um, let's say you have limited vacation time and you just want to make the most out of your time off. I think I would say, especially also for, um, you know, for taller people, right? Like having that lie flat bed, like makes, makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Um, a, a lot of the time. So yeah, we have, we have content, uh, uh, we have content around, you know, a huge range of those topics. And then these days we're also, you know, as the business grows, we're offering more products and services geared towards providing some of those same outcomes or facilitating some of those same outcomes for people who don't necessarily want to put in all the time and energy themselves. Okay, so give me an example of that. So, for example, um, we, we have quite a few, right? We have... Yeah, okay. So, for example, we have, we have quite a few. We've got, a, we've got an hourly consulting service right now, which is basically uh, you can talk to us for an hour and we kind of help you one-on-one -on -one yeah. with any step along the process, whether that's putting together a credit card strategy or uh, you have points. You, you're trying to understand this whole game of redeeming them, which is right another rabbit hole in itself and you'd like some assistance on that so you'd like to turn your points which you don't know how to redeem into a trip that you've booked on points at a great value so the consulting service can help with that and over time that's probably going to evolve towards uh, products that are more geared towards those specific outcomes that's something we're kind of building uh yeah this year this year as we go along we've got um We've got a membership program, which is very much geared towards learning and community uh, for people who are interested in this stuff, who want uh, a tribe of like-minded people that they can join, right? Travelers uh, who are all over the world and, um, and people that they can, you know, whether it's bounce ideas around as you're strategizing, or let's say you are in the midst of a trip and need some quick assistance on like a, a question that you don't know the answer to, but somebody else in the group might, that's where membership comes in and really kind of offers that community value. Um, we have, uh, we have you know, a series of events every year uh, where we kind of bring together the community and we have a series of, uh, of, of talks and presentations on the various topics, on the various things to learn. Is this mainly centered around using points? This is, yeah, Those so, events. so far these events are mainly centered around the art of, yeah, traveling on points. Over time, right, like anything, it can probably grow into covering some other topics sure. that are, you know, central to, to travel as well. But you just had one of these events in Toronto in October. We just did one in late October, yeah, October 2022. And the focus was, uh, yeah, well, for that one, it was like, uh, here's how to use your points to elevate your travels, yeah. right? Because at the end of the day, like, we are travelers at heart, <laughs> but we believe that using points is the best way to travel. Yeah. So that's kind of where it all comes together, right? This is the outcome um, that pretty much everyone universally aspires to. Like, you know, talk to anyone, they're like, oh yeah, I'd love to travel more, right? But, but for us, it's like, here's the best way for you to do it. And here's something that not many people know about that you should know about. Now, like the way I'm thinking about this is it seems like you're just changing the order and way that you do things. Like nothing in your behavior doesn't change. You're not necessarily trying to spend more money to get these points but you're just leveraging these welcome bonuses and different credit cards to then create these miles and take advantage of these programs to then travel with them right is, yeah. is that how to think of it like you're just changing the way you do things and the credit cards you spend on yeah the idea is never to spend more than you would otherwise right that's that's something that's an outcome you would like to avoid instead it's it's all about planning, you know, whatever spending that you were going to do, putting it on the right credit cards so that you're either unlocking a welcome bonus with that spend, right? Hitting that minimum spending requirements to unlock a welcome bonus. Or if you're not doing that, right, you're putting your spend on the credit card that will give you the highest um, earning rates for the category of your spend. So for example, the American Express Cobalt card in Canada gives you five times the points on food and drinks. One of the most powerful cards uh, in the country because those five times the points can be transferred to Aeroplan and then you can go book your business class and first class from there. So just by kind of going out to eat and drink and going to the grocery store, uh, you kind of, basically the, the, the card is five times the points up to $30,000 a year. And if you were to hit that, right, like that's, that's still a fair bit, but let's say a Canadian household, like family of four, I'd say that's, you know, within within reach. Oh God, um, inflation, food costs. Exactly, right? Kidding me? And then that's 150,000 points from $30,000 of spend. And then that's 5X'd? 
exactly. That's how you, your $30,000 goes to 150,000 points, which then if you were to transfer to Aeroplan is a round trip uh, for one person business class to Europe or Asia. Which would normally cost about how much? 6,000 to 8,000. Dollars. Uh, for Asia, yeah. For, for Europe, probably a bit lower, 4,000-ish. Wow. But okay. still, so, think so about the return you, on spend, right? So when you compare that to like a cashback card. Exactly. Like, let's You're say we just the do the- return is much bigger. Yeah, let's say we just do the, the quick maths, right? Of, on $30,000 in spent, spend on a 1% on a cashback, that's 300, right? On a 1. 1.25, 1.5 gets up to 400, 500 maybe. Um, but if you were to take those points, put it on the cobalt, get 150,000 points, transfer it to Aeroplan and book business class, you're looking at like $4,000 in oh, return geez. in value. Oh my God. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of where the value okay. play really Yeah. So in. this is what I'm really trying to understand because yes. I'm thinking like, wow, this is cool. This is a whole rabbit hole to dive down. Um, but like, I'm busy. I've got like some side hustles going yes. on. I've got my job here. I've got my rental properties to manage. I'm like, what's the return on my investment for learning about all this stuff and actually going down this route? Mm -hmm. That seems like a pretty good return on investment there. As long as it doesn't yeah. take me like, you know, too much time to learn all this stuff, but just that quick tip. So that quick tip, right, that illustrates the value at hand that, that's available for the taking, right? And when we first started, the, the perspective was very much like, okay, here's, like, here's all the value, like, you know, like, why, why aren't you taking advantage of it? Like, it, everybody should be doing this. Yeah. But over time, like, the reality I've found is, like you said, people have busy schedules, they've got families, they've got businesses to run, they've got, you know, day-to-day, -day, um, and it's hard to really you know, just shift the behavior of, of it's, it's impossible to shift yeah. everybody's behavior from like a, a non-believer into a fanatic, right? That's like, that was kind of the, the naive goal I had at the very start, but over time it's what I found to be more, um, more of a pragmatic path is very much like, okay, we have our community of, of, you know, super fans and people who are really dedicated, who've put in a lot of time, similar amount of time that I have into this stuff and who can on their own fully reap the rewards and travel the world in style. But we also have people, maybe perhaps like yourself, perhaps like some people listening who um, who see the value here, just maybe, you know, whether it's, you know, whether there's, there's something more interesting yeah. to them, whether it's something more, you know, central to who they are, they choose to spend their time on other things, but there's still other ways that, uh, that we can help them capture the value here. And that's yep. where some of our services come in, right? Yeah, like I wanna make a, you know, ideally in a perfect world, a small investment of time learning this stuff, mm -hmm. set up all my credit cards properly, spend, you know, keep, and then have it in the back of my head. Okay, I'm earning these. I think it gets confusing because travel is confusing enough. You have yeah. all the airlines, you have the different reward programs, you know, just the economics that you were talking about, like I didn't understand that before. And then you have like credit card points, but then points can be redeemed for miles, but then, you know, how many miles is a trip to from here to Europe and how much would that normally cost? So it's, I think the, what's hard for me to wrap my head around is the um, comparison between cashback dollars to air miles to points. Cause it's not like one even unit of no. measure. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to convert dollars to points to miles, I guess. But when you break down the cobalt example mm -hmm. and you're like, um, what did you say? Six to eight thousand dollars for that business class. Yeah, and you can get the business class by spending that, let's say, thirty thousand dollars. But then the cash back on the thirty thousand dollars is three hundred bucks. So it's like comparing six to eight thousand dollar flight versus the three hundred bucks. Then I'm like, okay, now I can. I'm thinking in the same unit of dollars. Yes. Now I see the return. Yes. But it's confusing trying to think of all that stuff. And it's confusing by design, because if the game were too easy and everyone played it, then you know there would be no game to play. Do you think that's what it is? It's it's. The loyalty program has to work in a way that it dangles a carrot on a stick in front of people, but it's not going to be fully obtainable by everybody who participates because otherwise the airline's out of business, right? If everybody gets business class at a fraction of the price. Yeah. So it has to be very attractive and it has to have some complexity to it for people to figure out. Um, and I, that's, that's why I went with cash in. back in the beginning. Cause it's like, I'm a very casual traveler. I mm -hmm. want to travel more. You know, that's part of the reason I'm doing these rental properties inside all, like all this stuff, you know, yes. it's in the future plans for me, but it's something I don't want to delay too long. Cause I know kids come and all this and, yeah. um, where was I going with this? But the uh, simplicity, right? No. Yeah. So that's why I went with cash back so many years ago. Cause it was like, okay, what's the best cash back? Cause I don't understand these miles and all this stuff. It was the complexity. And that's, that's perfectly valid. But I would say there's a 80, 20 sweet spot, right. In terms of optimizing and in terms of, you know, you put in your, your 20% of the effort for 80% of the gains, the remainder 
if this isn't like something you want to dedicate all your time to, perhaps doesn't matter. But if you can travel like one, one or two more trips a year, or if you can um, take the existing trips you do and travel in business class or have a better experience yeah. or both, then you're, you're winning, right? And by, by not having to modify your behavior too much, just by continuing to spend and setting yourself up with the right credit card strategy um, that you just fine tune like once every quarter or once every two, uh, twice a year or something like that. Dude, I'm already visualizing the business class trip I'm going to take by Perfect. by using these points and texting you like a photo of me in yeah. that cabin. I'm already excited to do that. I'm, I'm excited to see it. That's that's one of my favorite feelings, right? Seeing from be, our yeah. people in our community like, wow, first time flying in business class. A dream for most people, yes. right? It's just like something that most people never think they will get to experience. But when they find out about our content and put it into practice and whether they like take advantage of our help or they DIY it, like either way... Um, that's a transformational experience and and I'm very uh, honored and privileged to be able to have, you know, given that to to uh, to many travelers out there. That's incredible. Yeah, you've, re you've really built a purposeful business. You know, it's got a deeper purpose behind it. Yeah, and like I would that's say- That's everyone's big dream in life, travel the world. Yeah. You know, who doesn't want to travel the world? Exactly. I'm sure some people, but- Some people. Most people, especially people listening to this show, yeah. they want to travel the world. Yeah. And yeah. to do it in style. So he, let me ask you this, like, um, if you're using these miles, the business class takes more miles, you know, so some people will, will they just do economy just, just to maximize those miles for future trips? For sure. Unless there's, it's like a dream to do the business class thing. There's really no wrong way to yeah. play the game, right? Yeah, because yeah. if you think about it, there's, it's like, it's like, let's treat cashback simplicity as the baseline, right? That's like, okay, first of all, if you're not using a credit card, you are, that's the wrong way to play the game because you know, the, the, the wrong way to play the game is to either um, get hit with interest payments on credit cards, right? Is to be basically financially not responsible, yeah. right? As we talk about, like, if you're financially responsible and you're looking to, to, to optimize, then um, let's say 1.25% cash back is like your baseline. Mm -hmm. If you can beat that, then you're coming out ahead, yes. right? So, and oftentimes with even economy class flights, you can't beat that. With economy class flights, if we just do the value calculation, right, if we were to do it, you would typically get around 1.5 to 2 cents per point in terms of the return. So when I say cents per point, like going back to that business class example, that was closer to like 5 or 10 cents per point compared to the cash fare, right? We talked about business class being $4,000 compared to the uh, 150,000 uh, points, right? So that's that's closer to actually three to five cents per point. But the idea is like you're exceeding um, the 1.25 cents per point in return that you're getting from your cashback card. Mm. Is that the breakdown per point? 1.25 per point or per dollar spent? Per 1.25% return on your spend. Yes, return. Okay. Yeah. See, I'm already getting confused now. It's, with the, it, points, it's the miles, the yeah, dollars. Yeah, it, it can. Uh, I think a useful way to think about it is percentage return on your spend. Yes. Right? Because that's kind of, you're always looking to maximize that. Okay. Right? So just to crystallize it for people, right? $30,000 $30, spent on your cobalt, yeah. right? Either gives you your 1.25% fixed cashback return or in an optimized scenario, a cash fare worth $6,000 to $8,000 to Asia, right? A, a, a flight that would have otherwise cost yeah. you that. So the value the value there, right? The percentage return uh, is closer to, to we're gonna cut this out to make it look like I'm good at math, but um, <laughs> yeah, fifteen percent, sixteen percent, right? Six thousand on uh, thirty thousand dollars spent. Oh wow, well, yeah, better at math than me, man. Yeah, so but but that's the that's the idea, right? And the idea is even if you're not doing business class, and you're paying for you're using your points for an economy class Damn, flight, fifteen percent, sixteen percent on your spend. Yeah. Like if you're investing those dollars, which you're not, you're spending them. And as long as you're not like spending on purpose to get these points, you're spending the money anyways. Mm -hmm. To get a 15% money on your money spent is literally like a great investment return. So it's it's interesting when you think about, um, it's not a perfect, it's not a perfect like way to describe 15% because you also do have to factor in the fact that perhaps you wouldn't have paid for that business class fare in the first place. Right, mm. that that's how much it retails for. But if you wouldn't have paid for that, is it accurate to say that you got a fifteen percent return? That's subject to some debate, um, you know, in these circles. But what I guess you're maybe assuming if you're going to make that trip anyways. Yeah, but like in the honeymoon example. In the honeymoon example, perfect. Right. If you would have splurged for business class anyway, then redeeming points is definitely a better deal. 
But you could use those points potentially on economy too. That's the thing. So that's where there's you don't have debate, to right? do the business class. Yes, correct. Depends but how you having the travel. business class right gives you that. It yes, it maximizes the return and it gives you a much better experience. So yeah. that's but then that's it where it comes down, down to like subjectivity. personal preferences, exactly. right? Like how do you yeah. travel anyways? You know, would There's, you take that honeymoon trip in business or just economy? Like, yeah, yeah. Honeymoon, economy or business, or when we just bring it down to year after year travel patterns, some people in the community like to travel more often on like take more trips with the same number of points, even if they have to fly economy, yeah. right? They get to yeah. go to more places. Um, some people, let's say they have limited time off, they just get to take like two or three trips a year and they have the points to do business. So they're going to do business. So like I said, either way, you're coming out ahead against your cash back. So you're winning. Um, mm -hmm. And it doesn't really, it doesn't really make a difference like how that plays out for you as long as the way that you're redeeming your points aligns with what you want to do. Okay. What type of travel experience you want to have. Okay. So I think for people to learn the specifics and different credit card programs in Canada, let me just, oh, we're at 1030. Um, so let's just end with this. Um, I just want to stick to the high level principles because people can go to your site to learn mm -hmm. more on the specific cards and programs and that type of stuff. And it's going to be different for everyone. Um, but the, um, <clears throat> how many credit cards you can hold and, um, yeah, maximizing the amount of credit cards you have. And what if you already have a bunch of credit cards? Do you have to get rid of those to maybe get new ones? Yeah. So <clears throat> I know it's 1030. So we, yeah, we okay. Can, we can wrap. Yeah. So once you have a lot of credit cards, right, what do you do after that? Uh, there's a few options. Some credit cards have annual fees. So if you no longer find value in the annual fees, um, then it's either possible to downgrade the card to a no fee card so that you don't pay the fees going forward, or simply cancel the card. This is where a lot of people get tripped up too, because like if you cancel the card, is that bad for your credit? The answer is no, because when you cancel the card, uh, it remains on your credit file as a closed account for up to seven years. So it still contributes to your average length of credit history until seven years later when it drops off the file. Okay. Um, you don't want to cancel, like obviously open and cancel too many cards with a given bank uh, too rapidly, because then it it damages the relationship with your bank. Um, it, you know, they may just decide that you're not worth keeping as a customer if you're just, you know, hitting up these bonuses like every six months or every 12 months. Uh, there's, you know, the more aggressive you get, it's kind of a short-term game there where it's like you could possibly rack up a huge amount of points, but you might, the bank may no longer, no longer want to do business with you uh, if you've hit it too hard, right? So there's, generally speaking, like we recommend people to hold cards for at least six to 12 months. And then after that second year annual fee hits, it's a reasonable decision to make as to do you still find value in keeping the card? We talk about finding value in keeping the card, right? Some cards come with benefits that actually justify the value. So take the American Express Platinum card, for example, right? We talked about the Cobalt, that's kind of a mid-range card, like mass market. The Platinum is one of those higher end, uh, you know, luxury cards higher annual fee, but also comes with lots of benefits that can justify the annual fee for the right type of person. So um, when you travel, the Platinum card gives you unlimited access to airport lounges around the world, right? So the more frequently you travel, the more you'd value that benefit. And if you travel frequently enough, the card's annual fee of $699, um, which is actually $499 because there's a $200 travel credit on it that gets justified by your usage of the card. So really that's a calculation everybody's gotta make for themselves as to whether or not they find value in keeping a card. If so, keep it. If not, you can consider dropping it. And then after you've dropped it, right, there's other cards to apply for uh, and so on and so forth. So you're constantly playing this game of dropping and taking on new ones and finding the new programs? It depends It depends how, uh, how much you rely on welcome bonuses as your strategy, right? If you are kind of a regular you know, I would say actually it depends um, on your spend volume. Like if, you, if you're if you a high spender, then perhaps welcome bonuses play less of a role, right? Because you can actually earn points from your spend mm -hmm. and maximize them with things like the Cobalt card. If you hit that 30K, get your partner to open one. That's another 30K, right? Like during the year, that kind of thing. If you're a lower spender, um, then that's where welcome bonuses might be a, a bigger part of your strategy, right? And then you have to kind of carefully plan out your spending, which is limited in volume, to the minimum spends that you're trying to meet, right? Okay. Which is which are going to be attached with each welcome bonus. And then lastly, for business owners, right, for people with lots of business expenses and, and limited time, right, it makes sense to just keep a strategy on a more simple side, but to be, be optimized uh, with respect to where you're putting your business expenses and how the points you earn there are gonna fund uh, 
serve your your success either in terms of uh, business travel or personal travel. Mm. <clears throat> okay, I want to respect your time because uh, we said ten thirty. So, okay. but uh, I could talk to you all day, and yeah. so I definitely want to have you back. If you're good to keep talking, we can. But if not, totally understand. I should I should I should get going. Yeah, you but, should uh, get going. Okay, so we, we're, we have to have you back sometime. Yeah, um, for maybe sure. Maybe when you have another event coming up or whatever. Or a Zoom podcast is also cool because this is a whole new world um, to dive down. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, for me, um, when I saw like your life, your terms show, yeah. that was something that that I believe in very strongly, and I was very excited to be here. So this was a great conversation. We'll definitely keep it going. Yeah, awesome, man. It's very cool what you've done. Um, the community, everything. Yeah kudos. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks for having me on. No problem. Hey, thanks for tuning in. You can find every new episode of the Your Life, Your Term show on all the major streaming platforms. So Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. And if you'd like to get free copies of some of the books that we've put together, like these right here, or some of the reports that we've put together, like these right here, you can find all of those at www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's it for now. Until next time, your life, your terms.